So there's no doubt in my mind that that was the best stock car race that we've ever seen at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Period. End of story. Now, am I a little bit worried that I'm that I'm judging the race only on the last few laps? Possibly. Maybe if I've slept on it, maybe if I rewatch a few of the older races here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, maybe I can come up with a stock car race that was better than this one. But in the moment, as I sit here, I realize that I watched a stock car race today at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the Oval and I'm going to bed happy. And I think that's the highest praise I can give to a stock car race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This race was unbelievable. It potentially is going to top whatever we're going to see tomorrow, which could be a bit of an issue, which we'll talk about later on in this video. Um, and we're also going to kind of touch on a little bit IndyCar in Toronto. We're also going to touch, obviously, on the Brickyard 400, but the main focus is the NASCAR Xfinity race here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Craziness. I just can't even believe this race had everything working against it. It had a horsepower package that nobody likes. It's a stock car race on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There was a huge crash in the first lap where typically you think, uh oh, well, the race isn't going to be any good. And yet, and yet, Picasso painting out of nowhere. Speaking of Picasso, speaking of art, the car behind me is the only other survivor of that first Brickyard 400 still in existence. The other one you saw yesterday, the victor of this race, the Jeff Gordon Chevy Lumina. And this Chevy Lumina is the one driven by Danny Sullivan. It's called the Corporate Car of Indianapolis, and you've probably seen it because it's much more famous for being in Stapleton and Vinwicky uh, videos than actually being seen on the broadcast. But there is one really cool historical uh, fact about this race car and one that just kind of tickles my IMS fancy. There's a couple of stats from that first Brickyard 400 that I just love to remember. The first one is that the first qualification attempt ever here was a driver by the name of H.B. Bailey in a Pontiac. And this race car, the corporate car of Indianapolis, driven by 1985 Indianapolis 500 winner Danny Sullivan, brought out the first caution flag of the history of stock car racing here at Indianapolis officially when the side window blew out of it. Some people, some conspiracy theorists out there say it was because fellow Chevy uh, teammate Dale Earnhardt needed a yellow. I'll let you decide on whether or not that's true. But a beautiful machine. There's just something about particularly early 90s NASCARs, stock cars, NASCARs, stock cars, whatever we want to call them. That, that's just gorgeous. It's just something about that. I don't know what it is. And I don't know what about the modern cars I don't like, but that's just fantastic from a looks perspective, of course. When we're talking about racing, today was pretty damn good. And if we ever wanted to talk about the debate between the road course, and I even said it, I said, well, why not have Xfinity still on the road course and Cup on the oval? I thought today, why would you ever run the road course ever again? <laughs> uh, and, and, and to that point, why are we not doing the Freedom 100 again? Like the, the open wheel IndyCar series, that is the reason for this track existing and the reason for this track being what it is. IndyCar's feeder series doesn't get to run here and Xfinity gets to put on an amazing show like that. I don't know, I don't know. Um, speaking of IndyCar, Colton heard on the pole for tomorrow's race in Toronto. There was some controversy with Alex Pelot getting a blocking penalty. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I didn't see it. The Xfinity race was about to start. I'm here at this racetrack. I'm covering this. Quite frankly, I don't think there should ever be a conflict between an IndyCar race, a direct conflict especially, with an IndyCar race mm -hmm. and races on the oval track here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It just never should happen. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't happen uh, next year. That's for sure. Brickyard 400, which we will talk about in greater depth later. Tyler Reddick on the pole position for the Brickyard 400 for 2311 racing. It's not the first time we're going to talk about a monster energy car today. It's not going to be the last time we talk about 2311 racing in any context. So let's talk about this Xfinity race because, you know, I went into it in the last few years of Xfinity. I don't even think I've stayed for the entire race. Remember, this was, you know, the last couple of years, it's been a road course race. It started way late in the day and it was up against an IndyCar race, albeit on the same racetrack. 
once I was done with the IndyCar video, I really didn't have any time for Xfinity. And so I, I kind of worried a little bit going into this race. I said, am I going to be able to talk about the Xfinity race in Indianapolis or is it going to be so unnotable that I'm going to have nothing to say about it? Well, here's what I'm going to say. I already said, you know, kind of heap the greatest praise on, praise on this race that I could possibly do, which was that this is the greatest stock car race that's ever happened on this particular oval racetrack ever. Uh, and I don't even think it's close, but it played out like an Indy 500 in slow motion. The style of racing, the timing of passes, and yes, to be fair, like the fact that the leader was a sitting duck, which, you know, I, I think I accept a lot more in NASCAR stock car racing than I do in, actually at the real Indianapolis 500, right? And that's the thing. We're going to talk about the finish a little bit later, but the Indy 500 finished with a last lap pass and the Xfinity race finished with a last lap pass. Both races on the oval this year finishing with a last lap pass. The expectation level, I think, is extremely high for the Brickyard 400 tomorrow, which I'm a little bit worried it won't be able to uh, live up to. We talked about the 550 package. This is the lowest horsepower, you know, essentially super speedway package that Xfinity has available to them. And, you know, I'm one of the many people who have over the years given the, the 550 horsepower package a bad rap. Typically, you want more horsepower. You want more things to be in the driver's hands to create good racing. And it's funny because they have run a restrictor plate package here before at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with the Xfinity Series, but we've never seen anything like that. And I'm not sure what the change in the recipe was, if indeed there even was a change in the recipe from the last time the Xfinity cars raced around the oval here. But I'll say this, I don't really care how you made it, the dish tasted freaking fantastic. So from my perspective, hey NASCAR, guess what? Bring that package back as long as you were willing to serve it to us. That was fantastic. Let's talk about some, some reasons why this race was fantastic. But first I wanna talk about and give some shout outs to some drivers who, yes, are probably gonna get shouted out because racing nerds love them, but I'm a racing nerd and I love them. Uh, I, I wanna say this right off the bat because he was a little bit down in his post-race interview and I know he gets that way and I know he's gonna see this. So, Connor Daly, my man, do not be down on yourself. That was a stellar performance. Uh, especially the fact that you don't have experience on in an Xfinity car, an Xfinity car in those situations, and an Xfinity car under that kind of pressure, you're too hard on yourself. I think teams should be calling you because you were ripping it around the outside like TK on those restarts. You knew how to manage the race and the traffic, and yes, there was, you know, the last restart that Connor had wasn't the best. He kind of got schnookered a little bit by Austin Hill, but Austin Hill is one of the best drivers in this series. So Connor did a fantastic job. I was super duper duper impressed with him and had that last yellow not come out, Connor would have absolutely finished well within the top 10 and was knocking on the door of a few big dogs like Shane Van Gisbergen. And it's funny, when SVG in his first trip to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Oval gets a top five and we're not talking about it, that tells you about the quality of this race. Shane Van Gisbergen did a fantastic job and I think clearly has a feel for this racetrack. Um, I'm very excited to see him someday in a cup car here. And why the hell not? Let's get him in a damn Indy car and, and get, make him do the double because we know how talented SVG is. The finish, gotta talk about this finally. The, the fact that Cole Custer, you know, looked like he was going to dominate this race. It looked like it was going to be over. And then all of a sudden I noticed him starting to back up and it was Eric Almarola and Riley Herbst that were chasing him down. And I'm just sitting there thinking, and I'm, I'm like, I've seen races at this track before that look like this, both in the Indianapolis 500 and the Freedom 100, where the leader looks like he's got enough to win and then you just are kind of timing it out in your head, looking, doing the eyeball thing and saying, okay, well, the gap's closing and there's about five laps to go. And I, I tweeted out right before, you know, with like two laps to go, I said, the top three are going to be right together as they come to the white flag. And my God, 
they were three wide coming across the yard of bricks to take the white flag. What the hell is going on? I'm sitting there thinking, how is this happening in an Xfinity race at the Indianapolis 500 or the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Eric Almarola coming back from a spin just a few laps earlier. I mean, it wasn't that many laps that Almarola was backwards on the exit of turn one. Surely he was out of the race, but no, he's making the pass potentially for the win going into turn one on the last lap. That was unbelievable. But it was Riley Herbst that not only made the pass on the north end of the racetrack underneath Cole Custer on the last or the second to last lap, but then coming to the checkered flag, he was able to get underneath Eric Almarola and hold off his teammate Cole Custer to take one of the most spectacular wins I've ever seen in person here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And, and it's interesting too, because you know there's a lot of talk about Riley Herbst, right? And, and silly season, we talked about it on the NASCAR Weekly Podcast, which I'm really thankful that I was a guest on because it helped me with some of the storylines coming into this race. Riley Herbst, you know, there's always question marks about him. Is he worthy of a cup ride? Is he even worthy of the Xfinity ride he currently has? Today, definitely proved that out. And if he does indeed get that 2311 ride that's long rumored, uh, I, I think he's earned, uh, today, you, he stepped up at a big racetrack in a big event against drivers who have a ton more experience. Uh, you know, if you'd been a betting man, you wouldn't have bet on Riley Herbst, and yet he was the guy who got it done today. So uh, definitely a moment, a big moment for Riley Herbst in his career. Uh, this is a huge win for him, especially considering the potentiality of ending up in a 2311 Toyota next year. Um, I, and another interesting fact that was brought up after the race, and I didn't think about it right away, is that Tony Stewart goes 1-2 in his final Xfinity start as an owner, and Herbst and the crew even climbed the fence, reminiscent of when Tony Stewart did it. Of course, that tradition started by Elio Castroneves. But uh, Tony Stewart isn't here. Tony Stewart isn't even in the state. Tony Stewart's pretty much as far away from here without leaving the United States. He's in Seattle racing his top fuel dragster in the NHRA. So definitely tells you that Tony Stewart's definitely checked out uh, of, of, uh, of NASCAR. And, and, you know, it is what it is. And, of course, Cole Custer was uh, announced today that he's going to, of course, as, again, long rumored, will drive the Haas factory team NASCAR Cup Series car next year, which is essentially the, the bones of Stuart Haas racing, uh, what's left of it. Brickyard 400 tomorrow. The Xfinity Series unfortunately set a very high bar for the Cup Series to jump over tomorrow. Will it be worthy of cars like this, cars like the Jeff Gordon car, tomorrow. I certainly hope it is. I've heard ticket sales are, are pretty good. I mean, again, it's not going to look super full. In fact, today's Xfinity race, I would probably guess rivaled the IMSA crowd or rivals what the IMSA endurance crowd is going to be here in the fall. Wasn't an unbelievable crowd today, but of course the main course of our dish here at the, uh, at the uh, can you tell I'm hungry, uh, <laughs> at the Brickyard is tomorrow. So again, so many unknowns, so little practice, so little testing with these cars, the next gen cars on this Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's hard to know exactly what's going to happen. Chase Elliott looks extremely strong, but Tyler Reddick starting on the pole position, he's gonna to be tough to beat. A lot of talk about a lack of passing tomorrow. We'll have to wait and see whether or not that actually plays out. And if it doesn't, will NASCAR try to copy the Xfinity package as best they can for the Cup Series when they return here for the 31st anniversary of the first Brickyard 400 next year. Those questions will be answered tomorrow. Thank you guys so much for watching from a very happy Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Thank you guys and we'll see you in the next video.